Welcome to the podcast for Westside at Jesus Church. We are a family of missionary disciples in West Portland who believe the church is not a religious subculture, but the making of a new humanity. It's not a building or a weekend activity, but a community of multi-ethnic, multi-generational men and women living out the light, love, and hope of Jesus to the world around us. We hope this episode encourages and empowers you to love, learn, and live the way of Jesus as we pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Tim McDonald. I am the lead pastor here at Westside. I'm really excited to worship with you guys and open up the scriptures together. We are going to be diving into the text. So if you do need a Bible, there are men and women around the room that'd love to put a Bible into your hand. Uh, and if you don't have one, you're welcome to keep this one. A handful of weeks back, we started with this question, are you thirsty? Uh, we, we began looking at and exploring what does it look like to have this relationship with the Holy Spirit in light of the fact that we were created by God with this kind of almost cavernous need, this cavernous uh, capacity for desire. We are literally created to have a relationship with the divine. We drink deeply from his presence. The week after that, R Richard laid out kind of a theology for the Holy Spirit and talking a little bit about the fact that like the Holy Spirit is not a force, but actually he is a person, he is a power, he's a presence. And he ex we explored kind of like some of those categories of ways to think about the Holy Spirit. The week after that, Shelby kind of took us another level further to talk about what does it mean to live with his empowering presence, the Holy Spirit moving in us and moving us to, hit, to obedience. Uh, in fact, she explored the idea that Jesus is our primary example of what a, a spirit-led life looks like. She said that, you know, Jesus, he, he laid down his God powers or his God card, and he depended on the Holy Spirit to show us what it looks like to be fully human. And then last week, we explored the idea of abiding. Uh, and we talked about our relationship from the famous John 15 passage, uh, kind of our relationship as branches to, this, this, to our father who is like a vine dresser who literally prunes us for our good, prunes us for fruitfulness because he's got a vision for us. Uh, and then our relationship to the vine, Jesus, and the fact that we, we really can't be separated from the vine, otherwise we die and we need his life. Uh, we, we stepped from that into a conversation about the nature of abiding. And we, we talked about the fact that abiding isn't like this checklist sort of thing that we run through. It's actually a relationship. To abide is more like having a conversation with a trusted mentor who loves us and knows us. And he's got an amazing plan for our life. That's what it means to abide. And just like all good relationships, communication is central. Two-way communication. So... We're now at the halfway point in our series uh, walk, and, what it, and exploring what it means to walk by the Spirit. And we're going to spend the next couple of weeks specifically in the book of Galatians, a really famous kind of Spirit-directed passage. So if you've got your Bibles, flip open with me to Galatians 5, and we're going to pick up kind of a conversation that Paul has been having with this church. Galatians 5, verse 13. It's up on the screen if you don't have it. And he says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's pray before we jump in. 
Father, we thank you so much for being a God that is present with us. I thank you so much for the people here in this room and all that conversation that was happening just a moment ago. Lord, we thank you that we are a people, a community, and that you are our Father. Jesus, you are our Lord. And, and right now, Lord, we, just, we pray that you would open us up to your pace. Open us up to your path. We want to walk your way. So show us, Lord. Teach us, we pray. We love you. And Jesus, all of this today is about you. So we lock our eyes on you. In your name we pray. Amen. So I've got a bit of a confession to make. Don't worry. I don't think this confession will destroy the church. But, uh, but it's good. You know, like in a relationship, there's a little bit of honesty. I need to, you know, for us to move forward. It's good for you to know some things about me. And, and here we go. I love food. It's true. It's true. I, I love food. And it's a little bit complicated because more than just like loving the healthy stuff, I do like the healthy stuff too. I also like the unhealthy stuff. Anybody else willing to confess that out loud? There's a few people. At the nine o'clock, there was like seven people. I'm like, you're all liars. <laughs> you know, we, we, we know there's like, there's this part of us. It's like, yes, good, healthy food. We know we should eat it. And it's great and all that kind of stuff. But there is something about unhealthy food. This is specifically a problem for me as it relates to the idea of pizza. Um, any other pizza lovers in the room? Yeah, so I'm also like mostly gluten and dairy free, which makes pizza really complicated. And I've tried all sorts of alternatives, but they just don't taste the same. And so it comes down to this fact that every once in a while, I, I, I see this amazing pizza pie and I'm like, I want it. And... And I look at it and I'm like, okay, I know the ramifications of this. Now, there's probably a couple days of pain involved in consuming this thing. But sometimes it's worth it, right? My flesh is like, do it, do it. It's like the little like, you know, on the shoulder, yeah, eat it, it's okay, in the moment, live in the moment, right? And the other part of me is like, don't do it, man. You're gonna, you're gonna hate yourself in like 35 minutes from now. You know, and, and there's that little war. It's, it's a battle inside of us, right? And we've all been there. We, we may have different things that we wrestle with. But on the topic of food, I, by way of maybe one more commercial, I did bring up on stage some of the smoked pork that they have that they will be serving just after this gathering. In fact, you can see it's got a beautiful smoke ring and it just like falls off the... Uh, I probably shouldn't eat too much of that. Uh, oh. I don't know if that's kosher or not. Probably not. Um, that was a joke for all the Jewish laws there. Okay. Um, this is delicious. So I'm just telling you, you're going to want to get some of this after this gathering. But food is a good thing. You know, it's funny because there's this passage in Romans, uh, the Apostle Paul. He, he shares about his own kind of wrestling as it relates to who he is and what's going on in his heart and his mind. It's, it's in Romans 7. You don't have to flip there. It'll be up on the screen but I want you just to listen to this little dialogue that's going on kind of inside the Apostle Paul's heart. He says this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. Anybody else have that experience before? That wrestling inside of our nature? Like there's something inside of me that wants to have its own way and, and often, it's not the good stuff, right? And yet there's a part of me that, that wants to follow Jesus or wants to, to live a noble life, and they feel like they're at war with each other. Like Paul said in Galatians, there's a conflict going on there. You know, as an aside, isn't it, I don't know about you guys, but isn't it good to hear the Apostle Paul? This is the big A Apostle Paul wrote, like, most of the New Testament. And this is him. Isn't it good to know, like, he's wrestling with this stuff too. Years into his following of Jesus, he's still trying to make sense of these parts of his soul that compete together so we're in good company. Anyways, 
with this idea of this battle of thirsts in front of us, I want to take a look at this passage in Galatians as we explore what does it look like to walk by the Spirit. We're jumping into the middle of a conversation that Paul is having with the Galatians, and he's discussing the relationship with, between them, the law, and what it means to be free. The letter to the Galatians was written, kind of one of, part of the reason was they were dealing with some false teachings that had kind of begun to creep into the church. And Paul is challenging the Galatian church to continue walking in their newfound freedom. The Galatians, they had begun pursuing some other type of freedom. And Paul's saying like, no, the, you're supposed to be free from the law, free from the guilt the law brought with it, free from shame and free from condemnation. But this also meant that they were gaining something. They were gaining acceptance by God and access to God and, and a new family and an abundant life. Walking in this freedom was about fruitfulness. And we're gonna talk about fruit next week in this very famous passage. But our fruitfulness is on God's mind. And then Paul, he kind of changes the direction just a little bit at the beginning of this text. And he says that we were called to be free, but not to use that freedom for ourselves. Verse 13. Instead, we're supposed to serve one another. So this freedom that we gain in Jesus, it's not for us. It's actually for others. The law, says Paul, and says Jesus, is summed up in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is what it means to be free in Jesus. So Paul tells them, stop acting like animals, devouring each other and biting at each other. Like, act like children of God. And the first thing we learn about walking by the Spirit is that it impacts our relationships with each other, not just with God. Walking by the Spirit is about relationships. And Paul, he clarifies the nature of this freedom we have in Jesus. Our freedom does not give us the right to hurt others or ignore the Bible. In fact, our freedom connects our relationship with God to our relationship with others. This is super important for us to catch because our relationship with God is personal. It, it is our relationship, our personal relationship with him, but it is also shared. It's about us about those conversations that we were having just a few moments ago, a personal relationship, but also a shared relationship. Now, in light of our cultural moment, there's so much that we could say here about this, but I don't want to use Paul's words to be kind of like as an excuse to be passive aggressive. I just want to be super, super clear. Our freedom should never be used to indulge our broken desire to hurt other people. Let me say that again. Our freedom should never be used to indulge our broken desires to hurt other people, whether that's to their face or behind their back. I mean, how often in the name of our freedom have we ended up hurting those that might be a little different than us? Paul says, don't do it. We end up looking more like animals than God's children. In fact, Paul would argue that actually our, our freedom grants us more access to God's heart. If anything, we get more of him, more of his love, more of his compassion. John Stott has this incredible uh, quote. I want to read it to you guys. On the nature of freedom. It is freedom to approach God without fear, not freedom to exploit my neighbor without love. Indeed, so far from having liberty to ignore, neglect, or abuse our fellow men, we are commanded to love them and through love to serve them. We're not to use them as if they were things to serve us. We are to respect them as persons and give ourselves to serve them, sacrificing our good for theirs. Man, how, how counterintuitive for our culture today. Not theirs to ours. Christian liberty is service, not selfishness. It is a remarkable paradox, for from one point of view, Christian freedom is a form of slavery. Not slavery to our flesh, but to our neighbor. We are free in relationship to God, but slaves in relation to each other. This is the meaning of love. If we love one another, we shall serve one another. 
And if we serve one another, we shall not bite and devour one another in malicious talk or action. For biting and devouring are destructive, while love is constructive. It serves. Such a great quote. But how do we do this? I mean, how do we live this out? I mean, don't we run the risk of being taken advantage of? If I use my freedom to serve, won't I become a servant? Well, maybe, potentially. But again, like Jesus is our primary example of this, isn't he? And Jesus said, like, I didn't come to be served. I came to right. And in fact, he laid down his God card and walked by what? The Spirit. That's right. That's how Jesus did this, because he knew it was hard. It's hard to set aside those freedoms in the name of serving our neighbor and serving even our enemy. But Jesus says, that's why we walk by the Spirit. And it's our path as disciples as well. One step at a time, at the Spirit's direction, at the Spirit's pace, in relationship with him as a disciple of Jesus in community with his people. Which leads us to the second thought. Walking by the Spirit is about our formation. I mean, Paul assumes process here. He jumps right into a process and he holds, he like holds up to, against each other the life of the Spirit and how everyone else operates. And he calls us to walk differently. And he tells the Galatians, there's this internal conflict that you're having in verse 17. And we don't get to do whatever we want. No, we must learn to be led by the Spirit into maturity. That's what he says, verse 18. And there's something really important about this idea of walking with God. In fact, it's all throughout the Scriptures. Time and time again, no matter what the part of the Bible you're looking at, this theme of walking with God comes up. I was just scanning through a few of them. John 1, verse 7 says that we walk in the light. Ephesians 2, verses 10 says, God has good works that he's created in advance for us to walk in. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Romans 6, verse 4 says, we walk in the newness of life. Micah 6, verses 8, this famous justice passage, we do justice, we love mercy, and we walk humbly with our God. I mean, there's so many passages. Think about Psalm 23, verses 4, this famous psalm. Even when we walk through the valley of darkness, who's with us? Our good shepherd, he walks with us. Deuteronomy 8, 5 says, we keep the Lord's commands by fearing him and walking in his ways. And last, but definitely not least, Genesis, right back into the early garden, we get this picture of Adam and Eve going for a walk with God in the cool of the day. There's something deeply important about the pace and intentionality of walking, because because walking is the pace of formation or discipleship. We've heard this truth, and I wonder sometimes if we don't forget it, but like God, he loves us. And so we come to him just as we are, but he loves us so much that he's not willing to leave us that way. And so he takes us on a journey. He takes us on a walk. And finally, walking by the Spirit is about our flesh. Now, we, we see this, this conflict that Paul talks about between the flesh and the spirit, and they wrestle back and forth. And literally, the word flesh is used five times in this brief little passage. It's used 150 times in the New Testament. It is a very common word, and it's a very important word. So I wanted to spend a little time actually exploring this word together. Now, you guys know that we're kind of a big believer around here about raising up the next generation and working with young leaders. And it just so happens that I have like a handful of them in my own house. Um, all four of our kids are studying hard right now, but one of our, one of our kids is actually back from Bible college from Moody, uh, and he's been studying hard to become a pastor. So I thought it might be nice to bring him up on stage and give him a couple of Bible scholar questions uh, and allow him to interact with us. So could you guys uh, welcome Kelton on up to the stage? Hey, guys. Thank, thank you guys very much. Yeah, so Kelton. What does the word flesh mean? Sweet, for sure. Thank you. Well, I'll first just start off and say, I didn't know that it was bring your smoked meat to teach day, so yeah, well, I don't have anything for you guys. Sorry. You, you but can... the barbecue, plug number two. Check it out. 
Um, but yeah, so as my dad said, my name is Kelton, and I'm gonna help us understand a little bit more about this word, flesh. So the best way to understand the word is that we gotta go back to the original language and original translation, uh, which is the Greek. And the Greek word for flesh is the word sarx. Can you guys say that with me? Sarx. Sarx. Sarx, yeah. So I kinda led you straight there. There's a bit more oh, kinda sarx. in there. Sarx. Yeah, I can't do that. So I wasn't even gonna try. <laughs> But, but yeah, so we're starting with this word sarx. That's it translated from the Greek. And like many words we have in the English, it has a couple different meanings to the single word. So think of our English word fine. You can have a fine that you have to pay. You could have a pen that has a tip that is fine. Or you can have a slice of chocolate cake that is fine. It's kind of like that idea. Sarx is like that. Um, and we're gonna focus on just a couple of the important meanings of that today. So the first meaning basically means body or the physicality of who you are. We see John use this in his gospel when he says that the word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. Jesus became bones and skin. This word, this part of the meaning basically just describes our physical body. And the second major meaning, which is the one we're actually focusing on just a bit more today, has to do more with our broken and fallen human nature and the desires that come with that. So by looking at the things men and women who are a lot smarter than me have said, I've come up with a kind of road map to help us get to this word, Sarx. So to overview it, Sarx is our fallen human nature that we've inherited from our ancestors. Think back to Genesis 3 in the garden with Adam and Eve in the day of the fall. That day, our human nature was corrupted by sin, and we've been living with the pain of that ever since. Because of this brokenness done to our human nature, we are now constantly driven to seek our own self-gratification. I think about it like this. Rockefeller, one of the richest men, if not the richest man in American history, he was in an interview, and the interviewer looked at him, and he said, Rockefeller, how much, or, or what's the amount of money that's ever going to be enough for you? And then Rockefeller looked at him, smiled, and said, just a little bit more. And I think that that sums up this idea of Sarks pretty well. What's going to satisfy the deep, selfish desire in our heart, this idea of just a little bit more? So my simple definition that I came up with for Sarks, or this word flesh, is this. It's our broken human nature that drives us to gratify our own selfish desires. Does that work? Yeah, that's good. Perfect. Good job, man. Okay, so then when he says acts of the flesh, so when he says acts of the flesh, what does he mean by that? Totally sweet. Well, we'll go back actually to Galatians 5, where it tells us in chapter 5, verse 19, uh, that the acts of the flesh are obvious. So that helps us out there. I actually even love what the NLT says. It translates it a little bit better. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. So Paul lays it out for us super well. But to help explain the acts of the flesh a little bit, I need to clarify something really quick. When people nowadays hear the terminology, acts of the flesh, desires of the flesh, they almost always think about lust. And this is because we oversimplify the meaning of the word flesh. And Paul expands our understanding of the flesh in Galatians 5 as he lists these different acts of the flesh, showing that it's so much more uh, than just sexuality. He breaks it down into four different categories that we'll be breaking down using semicolons. And a lot of the words on this list kind of fit together and overlap a bit, that's totally okay. And some of them are gonna get kind of real and personal, so get ready for it. So Paul begins with the major category of the sins of sensuality. And the first couple words he puts in there are sexual immorality. And he begins with this because it basically encompasses all types of sexual sin. This is the general term used in scripture for sexual sin. Uh, this includes sleeping with your girlfriend or boyfriend, fiance, or someone that you don't even know. Uh, this is really any forms or all forms of sexual activity that falls outside the bounds of a marriage between a man and a woman. This could be pornography, sexual sin against yourself, lusting after another person, and this also includes sexual evil done to someone else. And impurity takes this just a step further. Impurity, the next word, is a very similar term as the one before, and they're often used together. They kind of help emphasize each other a little bit. Um, and this word focuses a bit more on the defilement and filthiness that comes with the sexual action itself. So impurity becomes more than just the sexual action, but that kind of pit in your stomach of shame that comes with it. Hmm. Now, debauchery is next. And that's not actually a very common word for us to use today, but it basically is the result of the two words that come before it. 
So um, when you become so trapped in the sin that it seems to never be enough for you, we see this with people addicted to pornography, where they keep going to different and darker material to kind of fulfill their temptation. And debauchery can fully take over and consume a person. So there's category number two Paul talks about is the sins of worship. And in this one, he lists idolatry and witchcraft. And idolatry is, uh, so like we all are worshiping something or someone. And idolatry is the act of worshiping something that's not the Lord. So in doing this, you can neglect the worship of the Lord. I look to Romans 1.25 where it talks about humanity rejecting the Lord and worshiping the created over the creator. So when we choose to worship things such as our job, our phone, uh, money, even things such as relationships or families over the Lord, we begin to walk the path of idolatry. We worship and thirst for the created over the creator. Now the next is witchcraft. And this is not very familiar to us today, but this is like the action of relying on and trying to manipulate dark powers to give you your desired result that you believe God can't or doesn't want to give you. And this actually stuff happens all over the world and even in our city today, and it's super scary. This is rejecting to trust the Lord alone and his provisions. So the next major section is the sins of relationship. And there's a bunch of words in here, so some of them will kind of be grouped together. And so the first one he starts off with, though, is hatred. And Paul begins here because it's the root of all the words that come after it. Hatred leads to discord and to jealousy, and the rest as the list goes on. If you have hatred in your heart, these are the actions that will follow. If you have bitterness or unforgiveness towards someone or yourself, you invite these desires and acts of the flesh to consume you. So out of this comes discord, which is actually so much more than just a gaming and communication channel. I'll be honest, I don't actually understand it very well, but that was just something for you youngins and gamers, so I want to chuck that out there. Anyway, back to what I was saying. So when we look at the definition of the word discord, it told me a disagreement between people. I'll be honest, I didn't think that was very great, but right under it was the definition for the musical term discord. And I thought that did a lot better. It said the lack of harmony between notes sounding together. And discord, when we were created to communicate with each other in harmony and beauty and not in disagreements, arguing and chaos. And so jealousy and fits of rage, we all kind of know what those are. So I'm gonna fast forward a bit to the selfish ambition because I think selfish ambition is the neglect of focusing on the good of others and seeking the honor and praise for ourselves, I think we're living in a bit of a selfish epidemic and the church needs to speak into it. The next two I'm gonna to group together, they're dissension and factions. And these are very similar terms and they actually translate well to the term division. And so they highlight the community that is broken and fragmented by sin. It's about creating division where there should be no division. We see this in politics, at workplaces, in families, and even in churches. And envy is the last one of this part of the list, and it's similar to jealousy and cements the importance of this idea by Paul. He wants his readers to see how destructive it is to be unsatisfied with the gifts of God as you chase after the possessions of others. God and his gifts are the only thing that can satisfy that thirst in you. And the last couple words um, are under the idea and the title of the sins of consumption. And the first one here, it begins with drunkenness. But this can really be applied to any sort of substance that you are consuming or indulging in that can give you over to the control of another, whether it's another person or a dark force. Uh, uh, when you get drunk or when you get high, we're inviting these things to consume us and we can become controlled by them and the revelous lifestyle. What seems like partying and games can become a cage for us. And with our broken human nature, we respond to this by needing just a little bit more to get that fixed. Now, the next is orgies, and I'll be honest, I have no idea where to start with this one, so, so, so all I'll say is this. <laughs> I, say, I, I just think it's so sad that our thirst for just a little bit more could turn into something like that. And so, yeah, Paul ends this list by just having three simple words and the like, and these help us see that this list isn't an exhaustive list, that this list is just a starting base point for the acts and desires of the flesh. And after Paul lists this list off, uh, he then drops this bomb of a verse on us. He says, as I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I'll be honest, when I look at that list, that kind of scares me because I know that I have lived in some of these before and I bet that you guys have as well. And I'll be honest, this one kind of stumps me. So dad, 
Do you have any thoughts? What, oh. what, what does it mean for us? Sure. What does it mean for us to not inherit the kingdom of God? Leave me the tough one, I mm-hmm. guess. Uh, I got you. Okay, okay. Yeah, so what, is, what does it mean to not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, I think, I mean, for me, honestly, I think you should answer the question. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay, so... Uh, I would would put it into the kind of the realm of walking the path to stick with this analogy of walking a path. It's like we're we're all being discipled into some way, right? Uh, And and there is a way to be discipled into the way of the world, to become increasingly like the kingdom of man, this kingdom that we now live in. Or there's a way to be discipled into the kingdom of God. And I think Paul, he creates a tension point for the readers to be able to be confronted by the fact that like, look, you need to decide which kingdom is, you're going to be discipled by. You're, you need to decide which path you're going to walk on because ultimately you're being discipled into something. And, and we know that the kingdom of this world is passing away. And that's important for us to catch. Like, like this, is, this world as we know it, the one that feels so tangible to us, it's the one that is passing away. And the kingdom of God will reign. He, Jesus, will reign forever and ever and ever. And so this is kind of like one of those, it's a pivot moment. Like, who are you going to become? So I think that's a part of what Paul's doing there. He's just confronting his readers with it. So, there hey, you go. great so, answer. Well, there you go. My dad, everybody. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kelton. Okay, so how do we overcome or kill the flesh. I mean, I, honestly, I think we could probably reframe my last point. It's more than just walking by the Spirit being about the flesh. It's actually about killing our flesh. And repeatedly throughout the scriptures, Paul circles back to this idea. What does it mean to kill our flesh? I want to I wanna explore this a little bit as we kind of are wrapping our time up together by looking at a slightly different passage that has really a lot of similar ideas. If you would, uh, in your Bible, just flip forward a little bit further to Colossians 3. Uh, in Colossians 3, we, we bump into Paul as he's like basically having a really similar conversation with the church of Colossae. And he's expressing and talking about this idea of killing and putting to death our flesh. And Colossians 3, verses 5, says this. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. It's another really similar list. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, In the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as the slander, rage, malice, filthy language from your lips. He's like like laying out this juxtaposition. The word there, uh, put to death, is the word necro in the Greek. And it actually, um, it carries with it more than just something dying. It carries with it the idea of actively killing. This is not something that is like a side thought for Paul. This is something that Paul is saying, like, look, you need to intentionally be about killing this because it's going to keep trying to raise up inside of you. I wonder how often um, we think that, like, wow, I dealt with that and now it's done. But that's not how life works, right? I dealt with this issue. I dealt with this sin. It's now behind me. No, we walk. We go through life. We take steps after the other. And so, so Paul's like, I mean, if, you're, if we're going to live this life, then we've got to kill our flesh actively in an ongoing way. Actually, we got a chance to pray with a gentleman after our first gathering. And he was sharing just about his experience and dealing with anger and, and just walking through a really difficult season right now and just having this bout of anger this last week that he just felt horrible about. And he's like, what do I do? How do I actively step into it? Well, first, that is the right question. We do actively step into it. But again, how how do we do this? Well, you guys notice that little therefore at the front of that passage, put to death therefore? Here's a little freebie for you. Every time you see the therefore, you need to ask the question, what's it there for, right? What's the therefore, therefore? All the Bible, you know, that's, that's just a trick of the trade. Um, 
So we need to back up in the passage and ask and look at it. What does Paul just say? Colossians 3 verse 1 says this. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Let me say that again. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. How do we step into this act of killing the flesh? Well, two big things. First, we remember whose we are. And then second, we remember who we are. And these two ideas, Paul in, like intrinsically links together. You are being made into something different, a new type of human being in the kingdom. And it's because we have this identity in Jesus. Jesus lays his life down for us, purchases a way for us to be in right relationship with his father and thus bring us into the family. We're becoming something new. These two ideas are pulled together in Paul's mind and it's how we tackle the flesh. Paul wants to redefine for us what the truest things about us are. We, we may think that these things that we're struggling with, and these things that we're wrestling with, these are the truest parts of us. Paul's like, no. No, the truest parts of you is that you are in Christ. So, what does that mean exactly? And how can I use this to shape my story? Well, I think in the vein of Paul, I will just say, like, there are times where I also wrestle with anger. It's been a part of my story since I was a kid. Uh, and honestly, I've got kind of this, this complex combination of both anger and the sensationable need to be right. Anybody else out there? <laughs> so just, I'm not alone. Okay, good. It's a bunch of friends, Okay. And I, and I know that I, I think some of the root of my anger, it comes from sorrow often. What I find when, when, I'm, when I'm wanting to feel sad, I actually find myself getting grumpy. And then there's this whole thing about wanting to be right, and I frankly just chalk that up to the fact that I'm a McDonald's, and it's a kind of a part of our narrative. I think we're just a family of like wanting to be right. It's what we do. Those two things come together, though, and they create complexity. They create difficulty for me. And I'll be honest, this last several weeks, have been, it's been tough, right? It's been hard. I'm in the process of saying goodbye to a friend, in the process of navigating difficulties and all the stuff that's going on. And honestly, I have been a bear to be with. My wife is right there, second row. She will attest to this. There's been days in the last couple of weeks that I just haven't been the nicest human that might be really hard for you guys to, to, to realize about me. But I honestly, I do have a bear side of me, a grumpy side of me. And the problem is, it's not just that I'll, I'll get short or not just that something will come out of my mouth. It's that when it happens, I know, I know that I wasn't supposed to say that thing. But then my pride comes in, right? And it becomes so incredibly difficult to simply say the words, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Anybody else? It's good. I'm, I'm glad I'm in, I'm in the presence of other humans. We wrestle with this. And Paul, he invites us into a process of saying, okay, what if, though, that's not the truest part of who you are? And so in these moments, I will, on a good day, stop. And I'll, I'll re-examine the path that I have begun to walk. I have gotten into a path of the flesh right now. Only my flesh would say words like that to people and I identify it and I point at it and I say, what, what does it look like to step off the path of the flesh and step onto the path of the kingdom? Now, seem complicated? Well, it's, it's a training ground. It's a part of learning. It's why, it's why it's a process. It's why it's a path. 
But this truly is the truest part of who I am. I had this morning in pre-gathering prayer just this, this vision that was given to me in the moment just kind of slammed into me of the father waiting on his front porch for the prodigal son's return. You know, my friends, he, when he looked out, he did not see his son covered in pig filth, ripped clothes. He saw his son, the prince, the heir. He saw who he really was. That's why he tucked up his garments. That's why he ran towards him and picked him up into his arms because he saw the truest thing about him. He was a part of this family. What does it look like for us to actively step off of the path that is leading us to destruction and step onto the path that leads us to life? It looks like us getting a vision that our Father has of us. This is who we really are. What kind of person are you? You're the person that says, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? That's who you are. If you follow in the way of Jesus, in this age, we will make mistakes. It's going to happen. When it does, the path of Jesus is one of restoration. It's one of kingdom. But what about, Tim, the fact that, like, I've been doing that, and I've been doing that for years, and I'm still struggling with the same problem. Paul goes on in this passage and he paints this picture of forward looking that someday all things will be made whole. But he paints a vision of who we are becoming. And I I love this image for us as a church because honestly, you guys, walking as a community through what has been such a difficult couple years, God is saying, hey, I'm not saying that you're all gonna be perfect like this. What I'm going to say is, as you walk this path towards me, I will make all things new. And we are part of that all things. You may feel discouraged. You may even feel lost. Like I have been stuck in the same rut over and over again. My friends, God says to you, I am making all things new. But again, we have to partner with him. So I want to invite you to stand up to your feet. We're going to do, we're going to close out our time together with just an exercise, frankly, a simple exercise. And actually, uh, I want to also extend an invitation. We're going to be doing some more of this on Tuesday morning at our Tuesday morning prayer time, which is open, 9 o'clock in the morning, open to anybody who can make it. We'd love to have you. But this is an exercise, a way of of examining our own hearts. I call it an identity exam. And it's kind of a, a way for us to prayerfully reflect and decide as disciples of Jesus to become something new. So let's close our eyes. Spirit, we just invite your presence. We know that you're here. We want to become a more, a, like more aware of you. So we open up our hands and we just say, make, yourself, make, make us aware of you, Lord. As you're sitting in that place with the Spirit, I want you just to think back over the last week or two. Like, is there a place of tension? Is there a moment where you, you know that you stepped out onto the other path? A place where God is saying, hey, you need to repent. I want you to hold it in front of you, kind of in your mind's eye. Hold it maybe with your left hand. At the exact same time, I want you to imagine whose we are. Imagine Jesus. Imagine him going to the cross. Imagine him laying down his life to pay for, to purchase you. 
and to deal with that sin. It's done. You've been made clean. And as a result of him making you clean, imagine now who you are. That brokenness, that sin. Maybe there's something that you need to do to make it right. Is there a person that you need to talk to, call up after the gathering? But allow the image that the Father sees when he looks at you to fill your space. And then remember who you're becoming. And then finally, just take a moment and just give thanks for God, for his loving kindness that he is making all things new. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters and I thank you so much for the fact that you love us so much. So much that you won't leave us where we're at. You love us so much that you step into our story, you change us, you transform us, you do a work in us. And Lord, we just say we want to be changed. We want to walk the path. We want to become the person that you see us to be. Help us be that person. We pray this all in your name, Jesus.